Afghanistan to provide a better understanding of what has taken place since the implement implementation of the South Asia, Asia strategy. Today, U.S. Air Force Major General James Hecker joins us from Kabul, Afghanistan. General Hecker is Commander, 9th Air and Space Expeditionary Task Force Afghanistan, Commander, NATO Air Command Afghanistan, Director for AFSAN's Air Component Coordination Element for U.S. Forces Afghanistan and support of NATO's Operation Resolute Support, and Deputy Commander Air for U.S. Forces Afghanistan. In these roles, he is responsible for the integration of air and space power in support of NATO's Operation Resolute Support. General Hecker oversees two air expedition expeditionary wings, two air expeditionary groups, two aerial ports of debarkation, and is responsible for supporting and coordinating development of the Afghan Air Force. We'll start today's briefing with a quick communication check. Sir, how do you hear us? Uh, Adrian, I have you loud and clear. How about me? Great. Please uh, take it away with any opening statement. Well, thanks, Adrian, and uh, good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. I'd like to talk today about the strategic air campaign and the status of the Afghanistan and coalition air forces. Here in Afghanistan, we are focused on helping the government reach a goal of 80% of the population under its control. We believe increasing Afghan air capability will be one of the most significant keys to expanding its control over the population in the next two years. Prior to discussing the air campaign and the Afghan Air Force, I'd like to provide an operational update on the offensive operation in Badakhshan in northeast Afghanistan. Over the past weekend, United States forces conducted air operations to strike Taliban and East Turkestan Islamic Movement, or ETIM, training facilities in Badakhshan province. The destruction of these training facilities prevent terrorists from planning any acts near the border with China and Tajikistan. The strikes also destroyed stolen Afghan National Army vehicles and the process of being converted to vehicle-borne imp improvised explosive devices. One brief note on in ETIM, which I just mentioned. They are a terrorist organization that operates in China and the border regions of Afghanistan. ETIM enjoys support from the Taliban in the mountains of Badakhshan. So hitting these Taliban training facilities and squeezing the Taliban support networks degrades ETIM capabilities. What I'd like to do is show you a couple videos of strikes in this area in Badakhshan. The first one that you're gonna see is a B-52 strike on a Taliban training camp in Badakhshan. Adrian, can you please roll the tape? This strike occurred on 4 February. Sir, the uh, first tape is complete. Okay, the second tape that you'll see is a, the, the second pass from the same B-52 uh, on, another on a different training camp in Badakhshan. Uh, this was also accomplished on 4 February. Uh, Adrian, go ahead and play that tape. Sir, the second tape is complete. 
Thanks, Adrian. Uh, for, from these videos, you can see how a single B-52 demonstrates its reach and lethality by setting a record employment of 24 precision-guided munitions against Taliban narcotics and training facilities. What allowed this impressive air, air power to be unleashed was a critical modification that we made to the B-52 at IUD in late November, installing a conventional rotary launcher that allows B-52s to carry more precision-guided munitions. As many of you are aware, Afghanistan has become CENTCOM's main effort, thanks to the recent successes in Iraq and Syria. This has allowed CENTCOM to shift more assets our way, which will significantly improve our ability to assist the Afghans. Here are three examples of air assets now available to our mission in Afghanistan. We have increased our close air support capabilities significantly by adding an A-10 squadron in Kandahar Air Force Base. We now have 50% more MQ-9 intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance aircraft. And we are adding an additional combat search and rescue squadron. Those are just the tangible air platforms in Afghanistan, and these platforms would have limited value if those were the only changes here. But another change is one you don't physically see. It is the change of the weight of effort of the intelligence community. The intelligence community is the backbone that develops our targets, provides data analysis, and eventually produces the targets we strike in Afghanistan. This is the intelligence community that spread throughout the security enterprise beyond Afghanistan. They analyze surveillance and reconnaissance data to develop the networks that produce targets for our air power to strike. This behind the scenes legwork allows us to hit the Taliban where it hurts most, whether it's command and control of their po or their pocketbooks. We will cripple their revenue generation enterprise. We will take away their ability to wage war on the battlefield and brutally murder innocent civilians like the recent cowardly acts that we witnessed in Kabul and Jalalabad. With the current uplift in resources, we can decimate Taliban command and control nodes. It means we can strike at the heart of training camps where they brainwash young men to strap on a suicide vest to kill themselves and their fellow Afghans who are working to rebuild the country. So let me talk a little bit more about the air campaign that began in November. As you know, 80 to 85 percent of the world's heroin comes from Afghanistan. The Taliban is a criminal organization that profits from selling illegal drugs. Since November 19, 2017, the Afghan 215th Corps, their Special Force Commandos, and Afghan Air Force, in close cooperation with U.S. forces, have denied the Taliban over 30 million in direct revenue, as well as over 160 million and denied revenue from drug traffic organizations, according to DEA estimates. And this will only continue, not just in Helmand, but throughout Afghanistan. I want to show you some recent videos from these strikes and also where we have employed the A-10 in the strategic air campaign. The next video that I will show you uh, will show a van. Inside that van are three Taliban. Uh, what you're not going to be able to see inside that van is also what they call a dishka. This is a 50 caliber machine gun that is used to either shoot down our aircraft or to shoot at the Afghan National Army. The A-10 on 20, the 24th uh, uh, of January did this strike and this was only four days after they arrived. So Adrian, can you go ahead and play that video? Sir, the video is complete. Thank you. The next video that you will see is uh, another B-52 strike. This one's in Helmand province, and it's on a narcotics production facility. This occurred on 2 February. Adrian, go ahead and please play that video.
Thank you. This is just the beginning of the unrelenting military pressure we and the Afghan military will inflict on the Taliban. And that includes Afghanistan's own Air Force. In fact, an A-29 Afghan aircraft dropped the first bomb of the air campaign on a drug lab, and I might add, shacked the target. One of the most important things I want to talk about in the, is the Afghan Air Force growth. It continues to grow in size and capability. While U.S. air power is destroying Taliban support elements in the deep fight, Afghan A-29s and MD-530 helicopters provide quick, lethal support to Afghan ground forces in the close fight. This growth has already started, but is going to continue. Eventually, we will almost triple the size of the Afghan Air Force, but this has to include more than an increase in quantity. We want to make sure the Afghan Air Force is both professional and capable. Pilots and maintenance teams are being trained in the United States, in Afghanistan, and other partner nations. And this kind of training includes not just developing skills, but a mindset that prevents civilian casualties to the greatest extent possible. Several times, Afghan pilots on missions have resisted dropping their bombs to avoid civilian casualties. This isn't the case with the Taliban. Innocent civilians have become the primary target of the Taliban's high-profile high attacks. Conversely, the Afghan Air Forces realizes dropping a bomb where insurgents have surrounded themselves with human shields means striking a fellow Afghan brother, sister, child, or grandparent. The Afghan Air Force takes every step possible to protect civilians and will continue to support the ANDSF to defend Afghanistan in the most responsible manner possible. Additionally, the Afghan Air Force is successfully fighting a war while simultaneously building an air force and giving it increasing capability, which is a very difficult feat to do at the same time. So let's talk about how the Afghan Air Force is equipped to win this fight. Right now, the Afghan Air Force has 12 A-29s, but that's going up to 25, more than double. Three A-29 pilots are now trained to drop laser-guided munitions. The first was dropped in training in December, so the Taliban can look forward to those laser-guided bombs raining on what used to be safe havens in the near future. The Afghans also have a fleet of 24 C-208s that have added an airdrop capability. They added a roll-up door to the side of the airplane. They travel at 300 feet, 100 knots, and airdrop munitions or supplies out the door and hit their targets within 70 meters. This enables them to do airdrop rather than landing an MI-17, which obviously reduces the risk in some regions. In the future, the Afghan Air Force will also get what we call AC-208s, and they'll get a total of 32 of them. These are similar to the, the C-208, but this is an attack model, so it will carry pods with laser-guided rockets and a gun. It can also capture full motion video and assist other aircraft to, to achieve precision targeting, making it an ISR asset, which is going to be key to enabling the A-29. Additionally, we've taken MD-530 attack helicopters and transformed, the transformed them into a very robust platform. For you folks in D.C., MD-530s are a small helicopter similar to, similar to those that report on the traffic jams on the beltway you experience every day. The Afghans have 25 of these right now, and they're going to get five more each quarter until they have a total of 55 in about a year and a half. The biggest difference between the Afghan MD-530s and those traffic helicopters is their ability to carry rockets and a gun. The Afghan National Army loves them. They have proven to be just the right platform to provide quick, lethal support to commandos and Afghan ground forces. Lastly, we recently delivered eight UH-60 Blackhawks to the Afghans over the last four months. They will eventually have a fleet of 159 of these. We are training 12 pilots who have gone through their initial phase and now are preparing for mission qualification training. They will be ready for combat operations starting in May. After that, we get about 80 crews every 10 weeks. So by the end of the year, we should have 28 pilots. I know I'm giving you a lot of details, but I really want to give you a good idea of the rigor of our strikes this winter. In 2017, the Afghan Air Force conducted approximately 2,000 airstrike sorties 
or roughly 40 strikes, sorties each week, with a record high of nearly 80 missions in a single week in October. To put this into context, the Afghan Air Force airstrike sorties are now almost double what the U.S. Air Force conducts in Afghanistan. Between the added air power provided by the United States new authorities and the Afghans' continuing Air Force growth, we are putting unrelenting pressure on the enemy these days. Obviously, air power is just one part of the effort in Afghanistan, but it's a very intimidating one. The Taliban trembles as they hear our approach. So now, they have a constant eye to the sky as we force them to engage our actual battlefield where the Afghans are attacking from all sides. The Taliban is looking up, not down, not across at their enemy, and we are seeing results. With that, let me please open it up to any questions you may have. Thanks, sir. We'll start with uh, Tara Kopp from Stars and Stripes. Uh, Military Times, thank you very much. Um, used to be Stars and Stripes. Uh, General, thanks for doing this for us. I have actually a bunch of questions based on all the information you provided. Um, first, the, the B-52 strike that you started off with, um, was that the same B-52 on both targets? And could you describe a little bit more the conventional rotary launcher modification you made to be able to hit those targets? I sure can. So to answer the first part of your question, that was the same B-52 on both of those strikes. In fact, this was the B-52 that set the record for the number of PGMs. So it had a third strike that you did not see. Um, so there's a total of 24 precision-guided munitions that went against those targets up at Badakhshan. Your second part was uh, what was added to the aircraft to make this possible. It used to be that the B-52 was able to drop 16 precision-guided munitions. Uh, now with this new rotary uh, launcher, it's able to drop 24 uh, precision-guided munitions, and it could do that all on one pass. But in this case, we had three separate targets, uh, so we did it in three different passes. Okay, and you just answered, so this was three separate sorties, or this was the same sortie that where both targets were hit? No, this was the same sortie. Uh, so on one sortie, they did three passes where they t dropped a total of 24 precision-guided munitions. Secondly, uh, you were just mentioning that the Afghan Air Force is now hitting or now conducting about twice as many strikes as uh, U.S. and coalition air. Did I hear you correctly? Yes, you did. It's, it's almost twice. Um, the exact numbers, uh, roughly, the Afghan Air Force, when they do a mission, uh, and they actually do a strike on that mission, so drop ordnance or shoot the gun, uh, they average about 40 of those kind of missions a week where they actually employ a weapon. Uh, contrasting this with what the United States Air Force does uh, in our coalition aircraft, uh, we average about 25 a week where we actually drop a munition. So as you can see, it's almost double what the Afghan Air Force does compared to what our coalition aircraft do. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, Sir, how do you hear us? We lost your audio briefly. Uh, I have you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we hear not very well. Okay, just uh, one, um, one of the main component. Oh, now he's talking again. You can't hear me. About the maintenance and logistics. He's talking again. We can't hear him. Sir, I think there's a delay in the line. We're going to let uh, Tara Kopp ask her question and then uh, wait a couple seconds, and then you'll probably have the time to respond. Over. So the maintenance and logistics piece of this, um, we've been hearing that there are plans to shift the entire maintenance and logistics responsibilities to the Afghans uh, within the calendar year. Um, could you confirm that? And you know, in the past, the, the logistics and maintenance part for any weapon system we have uh, helped train on, um, that's been kind of a, a weak spot. Uh, could you give a status report on that training now? 
Yeah, you bet. So uh, to answer the first part uh, of what you said in your question, do we plan to shift the 100% of the maintenance over to the Afghan maintenance by the end of the year? Uh, that is incorrect. Right now where we sit is uh, roughly about 20% of the maintenance done for the Afghan Air Force is done by the Afghan uh, maintainers. Uh, about 80% of the maintenance is done by contractors, contractors that the coalition hires to do that maintenance. Uh, we are in the process now from shifting that 80-20 split the other way. Um, so the goal as we go through um, uh, this campaign here is that we will shift it so that 80% of the maintenance is done by Afghans and 20% is done by contractors. And of those contractors, we're rewriting the contract so they will now start hiring Afghan local nationals as opposed to hiring from the United States or other coalition countries. Next to, uh, next to Ryan Brown, CNN. For doing this, uh, I just had a couple questions about the Badakhshan uh, strike. Uh, it's been reported, and you said at the opening remarks, that the East Turkestan Islamic movement was also targeted in these strikes. Is this the first time that this group has been targeted by U.S. or coalition aircraft? And under what authority is that done? Is it due to their connection to other groups? And. Uh, if you could also provide a little bit more clarity on where Badakhshan, these training camps were, were they part of the corridor that connects uh, to China? Okay, so uh, I'll answer the last part first. So uh, the uh, the strikes, you know, if, if you look, Badakhshan is in the northeast portion of uh, Afghanistan. There is a that small corridor that runs to basically where it gets to the border with China. It wasn't along that straight right there. It was inland from that or more to the east, and that's where the uh, strikes were conducted. Now, we didn't actually strike uh, ETIM terrorists uh, when we were doing this. We were strictly, or strictly striking the, uh, the training camps that both the Taliban as well as the ETIM use, uh, and we were using our existing authorities to do that. Next to Jamie McIntyre with the Washington Examiner. General, back here in Washington, you sometimes hear from armchair generals, something along the lines of, you can't bomb the enemy into submission. You know, air power is great, but uh, um, it, it can't do the job. What, what would your response be to that, to someone who thinks that um, this air campaign is, is, uh, can't be wholly effective in, in achieving the objective, which we're told is to uh, drive the Taliban to uh, the peace table. Yeah, I think you have to look at the strategic air campaign as just one at facet of the overall campaign. Um, and I agree, you're not just going to bomb them into submission. But it is another pressure point that we can put on them. You know, we, we have several things that we're trying to do here. We have diplomatic pressures uh, that our president and our State Department are putting on neighboring countries to make sure that they don't enable uh, any terrorist activity. Uh, we have the air campaign that I've been mentioning about today, and then we have the Afghan National Army, and they are trying to make sure that we get to 80% population control so that the Afghan government controls 80% of the population. And then we have social pressures that we put on, and these social pressures are going to be seen later this year at the upcoming elections. So it's not just one thing or the air campaign that you spoke of. It's a combination of all these things that we'll need that will force the Taliban to the reconciliation table. The other thing you hear back here in Washington is the people here see the high-profile deadly attacks in Kabul and other areas, uh, and they think the Taliban is winning or the Tal Taliban is gaining. How do you counter that kind of narrative um, given these, these sort of spectacular high-profile attacks? Well, quite frankly, it shows that they're losing because when they started this year, uh, they had what they called Operation Mansouri. Uh, and what they tried to accomplish with that was to take providences. They weren't able to do that. The Afghan National Army pushed them back. So then they tried to take uh, districts. They weren't able to do that. Air power and the Afghan National Army pushed them back from that. 
So they were really left with nothing else to do. So what did they do? They tried to grab some headlines. How do they try to grab headlines? By strapping a bomb around them or you know, making a vehicle-borne IED, going out and brutally murdering thousands and hundreds of their civilians. You know, that is not what the Afghan people are looking for. But that's what has, you know, come of the Taliban. They have not been able to do anything this year, so they go to these kind of measures to try to gain legit legitimacy, and the Afghan civilians can see right through it. Next to Louis Martinez with ABC. Hi, General. Um, I hope you can clear up some confusion for me based on your earlier comments about um, the Afghan Air Force uh, conducting double number of coalition strikes. Um, you mentioned that there were 12 A-29s, which I would assume are conducting the bulk of the, the, those ordnance drops or that close air support. Um, and yet we see in the numbers from AFSENT that the number of munitions being dropped uh, from coalition or U.S. aircraft are the highest it's been in, in a long time. So how do we correlate that in terms of, is it a semantics here in the terms that we're using more precision guided munitions than ever before versus A-29s which are just dropping caliber weapons uh, as opposed to uh, real ordnance. Okay, let me see if I can clear this up for you. So there are 12 A-29s like you spoke of, but they do not drop the vast majority uh, of the Afghan uh, Air Force uh, bombs. The most of them come off of an MD-530. As I told you, they, we, they have 25 MD-530s. They shoot laser-guided rockets, and they also shoot the gun. So when an MD-530 is in direct support of an Afghan National Army unit, and it goes out in front of the unit and shoots rocket uh, at the enemy to enable the scheme of maneuver for the Afghan National Army, that counts as a strike mission. Um, for us, you know, we just got another A-10 squadron to go along with our F-16 squadron. Uh, and then we have some uh, MQ-9s that also drop weapons. Uh, but if you look at the totals on who's doing mo the most shooting, you'll find that it's roughly double with the Afghan Air Force compared to what the Coalition Air Force is doing. And the vast majority of those are coming from that MD-530 aircraft which is just proven to be a great uh, force multiplier uh, for the ANDSF. And if I could follow up on a different, uh, the Badakhshan airstrikes, uh, does that have anything to do, when you mentioned Taliban, are you referring to Haqqani Network Taliban? Um, or do you have authorities to strike against the Haqqani Network uh, in eastern Afghanistan? And, and how often do you do that? So, so again, this, this wasn't an attack on people. This was an attack on uh, defensive fighting positions. And these were defensive fighting positions that we have witnessed the Taliban using, as well as ETIM using. Uh, so that is what this attack was against. Next to uh, Idris Ali with Reuters. Uh, very quickly, when did you see the shift from U.S. forces conducting the majority of strikes to Afghans. Um, was it, how long ago was that? Well, we officially became the main effort for CENTCOM on 1 February 2019. Uh, we started getting some additional aircraft about a week prior to that, uh, and we're still seeing some more that will come in here uh, in the next day or two. Uh, in addition to that, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing the shift from the federated system, the intelligence community, which takes a little bit longer to shift their effort uh, towards Afghanistan, and we will see that play out through the next month. In addition to the air power that I've discussed, we're also getting the Army SFAB, or Security Forces Assistant Brigade, which will be showing up around mid-next month. But the, the, the Afghan um, Air Force taking more strikes, uh, what procedures do you have in place, because I know you guys, the U.S. Air Force, for example, does have protocols to avoid civilian casualties. Are you concerned that as the Afghan Air Force takes more strikes, that civilian casualties could rise? You know, the, the good thing about that is 
a lot of the Afghan, or most of the Afghan uh, pilots are trained in the United States or in other Western countries. During their time there, uh, they, have tr they are trained on our ideals and how much that we uh, uh, try to avoid civilian casualties. Uh, A-29 pilots routinely will come back with their bombs because they saw a child or they saw a lady or a mosque near the target, which is exactly what we want. You know, we, we, we praise them for doing that as opposed to say, why don't you drop your bomb? Uh, so that is very good. The other thing you were talking about, what's going on and how are we training them? Uh, let me tell you about a story uh, in Helmand Province. Uh, Helmand Province has, uh, has a series of operation uh, and it's called the Maiwan Operation. Uh, we're currently on Maiwan 11. When we got to about Maiwan 9, we were able to do something for the first time with all Afghan. And this is going to be Army and an Air Force story. So on Maiwan 9, uh, the Army uh, were gonna, was going to do a schema maneuver. So they wrote their own targeting package, sent it up to the Afghan Minister of Defense, you know, their Pentagon, if you will. Uh, they took that target. Uh, they sent it off to the mission planning cell at Kabul. They planned that target. And then they sent that to the Wing Operations Center down at Kandahar. Uh, at Kandahar, they gave that targeting package to the A-29 pilots and said, hey, take off at 8 o'clock, be airborne at 9 o'clock over the target. At 8 o'clock, the ground commander took off an Afghan-owned Scan Eagle, which is an intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance uh, platform that can do full motion video. They're in their own Afghan Joint Operations Center looking at the video. An hour later, the A-29s check in. They check into the Afghan Terminal Air Controller, the equivalent of our US JTAC. That ATAC, Afghan Terminal Air Controller, talks the A-29 onto a target. They strike the target, and then the Afghan National Army takes the hill. All done by Afghans, you know, from the beginning of the schema maneuver to producing a target package to getting it through their Pentagon down to the A-29 pilots to the ISR platform, that their ISR platform uh, to, to see where the enemy is. That is how far that the Afghan Air Force and Afghan National Army has come. Thank you. Next to uh, T.M. Gibbons Neff with the New York Times. Hey, sir, thanks for doing this. A uh, couple questions. First, going to start with you're talking about, you know, surging air assets into Afghanistan. I'd like to hear, you know, how your staff has added personnel to investigate uh, civilian casualties, you know, uh, you know a la uh, OIR and how they kind of, you know, gave monthly reports on you know, civilian casualties or at least assessments that uh, airstrikes, you know, pro you know, created civilian casualties. Uh, and then I have a couple follow-ups. You bet. Uh, well, we haven't a added any staff um, to take into account any additional civilian casualties. Uh, as you know, over the last several months, uh, coalition air power has increased uh, airstrikes significantly. In 2017, we've done more airstrikes than we did in 2015 and 14 combined. Uh, yet, in 2017, this past year, our civilian casualty rate has significantly gone down. Uh, and we don't expect that it's going to change. And we continue to strive for perfection. We go to extraordinary efforts to avoid civilian casualties, and we don't see an increase in air power will change that one bit. Thanks. And then uh, the follow-up questions, you talked about how quickly the Afghan Air Force can respond, uh, whether it be with an A-29 or an MD-530. I understand the MD-530s take around anywhere between 4 to 12 hours to react to, say, a close air support request. And then your A-29s can go from a day to two days before they can action a target. Uh, can you just explain, you know, what the U.S. is doing to cut that time down and why the Afghan targeting process is the way it is? and then I, I'm going to hit you with one more. Yeah, you bet. So uh, here's what we've already done, and I'll use that Maiwan example. 
It used to be with the A-29 aircraft, we just did what we call deliberate targeting. Um, when we do deliberate targeting in the Coalition Air Force or for U.S. Air Power, it's pretty much a 72-hour cycle, you know, to find the target, get it approved through the targeting package, get it through the air tasking order, and then down to the crew to actually fly. Uh, the way that we get around that in the Coalition Air Force is we do something called XCAS, okay, close air support, where we just take off the aircraft, get it in the ven general vicinity, and then we have a J JTAG, Joint Tactical Air Controller, talk them onto the target. Well, that is what we just started about three months ago in Maiwan 9 with the Afghan Air Force A-29s. So now they do not need a deliberate target with exact coordinates on what to hit. Uh, we simply give them a targeting package that says, be in this general area, this 10 nautical mile uh, circle at 0900, let's say. Okay, so they will take off not knowing what their target's gonna be. All they know is they will have some intelligence surveillance reconnaissance aircraft, and they will have somebody in the Joint Operations Center, and then they will also have um, a ATAC, Afghanistan Terminal Air Controller, to talk them onto the target. They get airborne, they get there, and they just start doing circles, waiting for them to give them a target. So now they can be immediately responsive for that two-hour period that they're airborne. Now they don't have the capability that we do where we can go get some gas off a, a U.S. tanker. They don't have that capability. So when they go up there, they have about two hours. We always sync that up with the Afghan National Army scheme of maneuver. So when they need help, they have help and it's right there with either A-29s and MD-530s, by the way, are also doing the same tactic. And now they're able to dynamically hit targets as opposed to have a deliberate target when they take off. Got it. And last question. Uh, Resolute Support has been touting, you know, this narcotics, you know, anti-narcotics operations, $30 million, $40 million, whatever. I mean, this is not the first time that we've targeted Taliban narcotics in this war. And I just want some kind of explanation on what exactly that does to, you know, quote, Taliban operations. I mean, has that, have you seen any effect on the battlefield after blowing these things up? Or is this just something we're going to do for the next 10 years? No, what we're going to do, this is just one more, you know, pressure point than we could put on the Taliban. You know, it's going after their revenue sources. You know, we mentioned narcotics, but we're also going out of the, after their command and control, after their safe havens, uh, those kind of things as well, which will put pressure uh, on the Taliban. Um, and what we see, you know, got it. You know, we, we don't listen to intel and, and hear oh my gosh, we just lost $5 million today. Um, and then I know there's a big dispute on, is this you know, 40 million, how exactly do you come up with this figure in the 160 million? What I care about is it's affecting the Taliban. And when we do these strikes, we obviously get reflections fr from different sources on intel. And what we're seeing is this is throwing them off their game. It's putting turmoil into their process. And that's exactly the effect that we're looking to get. Nearly time, so we'll go to Lucas Thomason and then over to Jeff Shogel. General, how many bombs or other munitions did U.S. aircraft drop in the month of January? Uh, Lucas, I, I apologize. I don't have that exact number on how many uh, we dropped in January. I will tell you uh, over the last four to five days, we've seen a significant increase of the number of bombs that we have dropped, but I don't have an exact number for you. And would you like to see the Taliban be labeled a terrorist group after this rise of attacks in Kabul? You know, I'm gonna leave that, you know, to, uh, to our people in Washington. It's their decision on what we label the Taliban. Uh, my label for the Taliban is uh, a group um, that kills innocent children and women. They are not able to meet us on the battlefield, so they resort to those kind of tactics. Uh, and I know that the Afghanistan civilians, that is nothing that they're gonna support, and it's nothing that we're gonna sit idly by and watch them do. So we're gonna take the fight to them, 
and uh, make them reconcile. Has Pakistan been helpful in any of these airstrikes thus far? Uh, those B-52s do fly over the country of Pakistan, don't they? They do. Uh, there is a corridor that, uh, that we have uh, with Pakistan, so they're coming out of IUD and they will fly over uh, Pakistan uh, as they come in to drop their weapons. So has Pakistan been helpful in this uh, ramp up of operations against the Taliban? Well, that's something that, you know, we continue to try to work together uh, on. You know, we look for common ground as, as our strategic uh, the new South Asia policy is a regional approach. Uh, we look to Pakistan, we look to Iran, to, to Russia, uh, on where we can find some common ground. Um, you know, we, they realize, you know, a lot of the narcotics go into their countries. Uh, Iran, you know, is dependent upon the water uh, that comes uh, from Afghanistan. So that's some common ground we can look at. Uh, as was mentioned by our president, you know, we are putting some diplomatic pressures to make sure that regional countries don't enable these terrorists. And they will we'll continue to put that pressure on. Uh, and if they're willing to help us, uh, we will definitely uh, work with them uh, and share intelligence together uh, to get rid of these terrorist networks. General. Finally, to Jeff Shogel with Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you, General. You mentioned that uh, Afghanistan became CENTCOM's priority as of February 1st. I know it's only been uh, less than a week, but can you give some idea of how your sortie rate and weapons release rates have increased since February 1st? So uh, our sortie rates have increased because we have uh, another squadron of A-10s that we're flying. Um, and, and they fly, you know, 10 to 12 lines uh, every day. Uh, we have another 50% more MQ-9s, so we're flying uh, more lines uh, with the MQ-9s. What those MQ-9s allow us to do is find more targets. Uh, those targets can go after drug labs, command and control facilities, or training camps uh, up at Badakhshan, which has allowed us to significantly, over the last week, increase our strike rate. Uh, you had mentioned that the Afghans are dropping weapons a certain amount of time. Is it really an apples-to-apples -apples comparison when you're talking about an MD-530 firing a machine gun or a rocket versus a B-52 dropping a precision-guided ordnance? No, that is, you know, and it wasn't meant to be a total apples-to-apples -apples comparison, uh, but I wouldn't say it's apples-to-oranges either. Um, if you're on the other side of that rocket and you're a Taliban, you probably don't care if it's a rocket or if it's a PGM that's hitting you in the forehead. Um, so, um, you know, we have, for instance, a B-52. Uh, as you just saw today, uh, you can drop 24 of those. On an A-29, they don't have places, you know, to hang 24 bombs on their wing. Uh, but they can drop four bombs. They can shoot up to 14 rockets, and they can shoot 30 caliber uh, uh, machine gun at the enemy. Uh, they're getting more and more capable. As I mentioned, the A-29s are going to have a precision guided uh, capability uh, here very shortly. Three pilots are trained right now, but we're going to train the rest of them. We're going to get an AC-208, the attack version, and it's going to have laser guided rockets, just like our A-10s, just like our F-16s have today. So they're not as capable today, and they never will be as capable as an F-16 with the platforms that they have. Uh, but they're becoming extremely more capable than they are right now, and it's a real good fit uh, for what they need here in Afghanistan. Last question. Thank you for your time. Has the U.S. dropped a massive ordnance penetrator or MOAB since uh, the last time? No, we have not. Um, you know, I showed up a week prior to the MOAB uh, being dropped, um, but we never take anything off the table, you know, so, so it's there if we need it, but we haven't seen a target uh, set that requires it. And quite honestly, after only being here a week and my mom heard that a MOAB was dropped, she immediately, you know, sent me a note and asked if I was okay. 
and I let her know that you know we won't drop on ourselves. This is meant for the enemy. Um, but it's there if we need it. But right now, uh, we don't have a, a use for it. But if we do, uh, it's there for us. Sir, thank you very much for your time. Do you have any closing remarks for the group? Yes, first, I, I'd just like to thank everybody. I know your weather wasn't great uh, coming in this morning. Um, but if there's anything that I didn't answer to your satisfaction, uh, please uh, feel free to talk to Adrian there and he can get you any more information that you need. With that said, let me just finish with a few parting words. Uh, here's what I know today. When the Taliban started out, civilian casualties were collateral damage, something that they wanted to avoid as they pursued military targets as part of the, their campaign, Operation Mansouri. But last year, in a year when our primary objective was to help the Afghan military grow more rapidly and become more capable uh, as we moved on the offensive, we still were able to hold off the Taliban. They made no territorial gains last year. And as a result, they tried to show their continued relevance by conducting, conducting numerous high-profile attacks that killed hundreds of innocent Afghans. Our goal was to build a military and from where I sit, a big part of that military was the Air Force. The Intercontinental Hotel, Save the Children, and the other recent attacks, they brought the Taliban headlines, but as we all know, the real headline is how they continue to kill innocent fellow Afghans. That's not leadership. That's not what the Afghanistan or any other country needs. Driving an ambulance through, a, through Kabul and blowing it up that's not even something that the old guard Taliban would have done. It shows how desperate they've become as we ratchet up the pressure with increased air power. The Taliban cannot win on the battlefield. So that is why they have resorted to slaughtering civilians. But war is a test of wills and the Afghanistan military has that resolve. On top of that, they are becoming more capable every day. With the new South Asia strategy, the Taliban now no, we have no timetable for when we're going to leave Afghanistan. It's condition-based. They see the resolute commitment from the United States and the coalition. More, more importantly, they see that commitment from the Afghan government and military that want to take back their country and restore stability and secure their homeland. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the videos from today's briefing will be up very shortly on uh, Oris's uh, David's page. One more small question to the general. He's still around. Hi. We have to wrap it up. Thank you.